Good afternoon, everybody. How are we feeling? Good? Yay! Welcome to the final, the beginning of the climax, the final <laughs> climax of the whole IPP 2014 conference. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Mary L. Gray from Microsoft Research. So she's a senior research, uh, researcher at Microsoft Research's New England facility, but she also maintains an appointment as an associate professor in the media school uh, and also with adjunct appointments in American studies, anthropology, and gender studies at Indiana University. Um, so Mary studied anthropology uh, before receiving her PhD in communication from the University of California. And so she's an extremely interdisciplinary individual, gr great uh, uh, a met metaphor of, of our entire community and conference here. Um, and her, her, her previous book, uh, Out in the Country, Youth, Media and Queer Visibility in Rural America, won various kinds of scholarly prizes. And, and now she's working on her uh, next hit publication, um, <laughs> With, uh, uh, with computer scientist Siddhartha Suri, which is about uh, digital workforces and the future of employment. And I assume that it draws on her current project at Microsoft Research, which is titled Face in the Crowd, which I think really is a lovely name uh, for a project that aims to uh, uh, look, at, look behind the veil and see who the workers really are. And um, finally, I've, I've learned that she once spent a night on the face of Mount Whitney, the uh, highest peak in continental United States. So with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please welcome Mary L. Gray. Thank you. <laughs> Billy had told me that he'd looked up some fact about me, and that was going to be a surprise. And that, that is indeed true, and I can tell you all about it at drinks at the reception. Um, and this is my first time presenting with a bow tie. I'm very excited. Oxford just brought it out. I'm so excited. I learned how to tie it. I'm like, I've got to wear this thing. Um, so I'm going to try and bring us full circle from what I thought was a beautiful opening keynote. I was just really um, so appreciative of having it begin in this incredibly hopeful, joyful place. And I don't want this to be the downer session <laughs> at all. And in many ways, where I want to land is how can we imagine um, how to better support the futures of crowd uh, work? Because I think in many ways, even when we look at the playfulness in the examples from that opening keynote, there's still labor uh, that's there. And so a lot of what I want to do with this keynote um, is to think about he even in cases where um, it's play, it's politics, it's learning, there's still the activity of engagement um, that we could imagine circulating a kind of human labor and uh, what it would mean to, to attend to that. So I'm going to talk about labor, but I really hope that it'll to speak, uh, will speak to many of your projects. Um, and as an overview, my goal is to really flesh out the crowd. So in many ways, we talk about this kind of aggregate, um, and I've, I want to run through a couple of ways in which we we conceptualize crowds, I want to put some flesh on the bones uh, for this session. So I'm going to spend, um, I, if you'll indulge me, I want to share a lot of the data I have that's fresh in my head from this project that Sid and I are working on in collaboration with another of our co-authors is here, Sarah Kingsley. Um, it's a fairly um, uh, complicated project. There are a lot of moving parts, and so I have lots of bits to share with you. But they are all towards this goal of fleshing out um, who we might imagine when we say the crowd. And then secondly, I want to use it as, as a chance to highlight um, strategies, methods for studying the crowd close up and at scale, to be able to imagine what it would be like to see the um, range. We could think maybe dimensionally about the experience of crowdness for all the projects that we have. What would it look like to try and scale those dimensions? And not just scale up or down, but rather um, to really think um, about uh, the, the really beautiful clustering that happens, the kind of horizontalness to uh, the crowd. And then lastly, I want to leave you with um, a very tentative, very much work in progress um, set of thoughts on theorizing the condition of crowd labor toward the goal of, of imagining how we might improve it. What would we need? What are the social and material conditions that are going to improve the possibilities that we, um, I think we all I uh, had a chance to uh, share through the last couple of days of the possibilities 
of being able to um, imagine both a coming together um, at a massive scale that can be incredibly powerful. So I want to start with recharacterizing the crowd. Uh, in many ways, the words we tend to associate with the crowd are anonymous, massive, I hear massive quite a bit, uh, atomized, um, unruly. Uh, there are many ways in which um, our thoughts on what a crowd is are awfully hard to divorce from um, perhaps early, uh, earlier century notions of the mob. So to be able to see how charged it is for us to talk about um, large groups of people we don't know doing things at a distance. Uh, and what I'd ask is if we think about facing the crowd and recharacterize the crowd with some other elements that come from um, looking at very specific practices of engagement um, in the crowd, that we'd see a lot of sociability, uh, we'd see an intimacy, um, perhaps uh, the networks that we already can plot, but to be able to see a kind of clustering that's very much engaged with an offline world that we're not privy to and that can't be mapped in the system, and that it's actually relatively organized um, in ways that we also can't quite map to the ways we look at it. Um, in a nutshell, the argument here is that crowds are multidimensional. Uh, and, and using science technology studies as a way of, of framing this, we could say it's a very complicated socio-technical system. It involves human labor of all kinds, again, whether we're talking about um, being at play or thinking together or um, doing other kinds of activities. Uh, it involves social connections that are both a part of that network, but also support people coming in or not making it to those, um, to those points of access to the crowd. Um, it's always also about economic transactions, whether pay is being exchanged or not. It's always deploying an infrastructure that somebody paid for um, and somebody may not be able to afford. It absolutely crosses a myriad of international laws, and I think that's one of my favorite places to fret is just how complicated these laws are, particularly around labor politics. And then lastly, it's distributed computation. It's not a sole system for organizing these materials. So as many of you who have ever had to um, clean data know, uh, if you're working with one system that might have collected some information from a part of the crowd, and perhaps you have access to another data set, getting those to talk together is a, is a pretty complicated process. So before I leap forward to where we're at right now and towards a goal of thinking about the future, I want to spend a teeny bit of time dwelling on some analogs to crowd labor's past or possible past. Um, piecework is a nice, um, a, a nice allegory here of imagining um, work that was always contingent it wasn't something stable. It might be available, might not be available. But it was necessarily part of um, technological innovation that had centers and margins. So the best example for piecework is to think about the industrial age, the textile revolution, that looms could absolutely do the kind of textile production that never had been possible before. But oh, if you want that flourish or beautiful button, it's going to take finishing. It's going to take assembly work. And the organizing of that finishing, where the technological innovation fell short, was something that could be shipped or could be um, brought in from often local um, rural communities and farmers who were on their off season who could pick up that work. It started as women's work and quickly became family-based work in the home. So imagining how those moves to be able to have the finishing touches of where technology leaves off if you'll keep that in mind as part of this, of this framing of, of crowd labor's past. But an, an important element of that is that there were always margins and centers to the possibility of accessing that kind of work. You had to be near enough to a city center that had that kind of textile industry, and you had to have enough infrastructure that was going to get you from the route of your farm back in and out of the city. You had to have the means of transportation to get you back and forth. So if you keep that in mind, one of the more recent and really the first reference to digital piecework was actually a patent by uh, Schneier et al. describing, of all things, a grading program. So the idea of this program, and anybody studying MOOCs, please keep your ears open and take a look at this paper. The notion was that it was contingent. Um, papers may or may not come into the system. It was meant to aggregate different papers that were available through the system was imagined that it could take lots of different topics. And if I had expertise in mathematics, I could pick up those papers. If I had expertise in history, I could pick up those papers. 
um, but that the work that it would entail would be detailed and require human judgment uh, and would necessarily be about that kind of evaluation that could be literally picked up. I could perhaps do a paragraph, and when I could no longer do it, I could put it back in the system and somebody could check it back out. So this was 1996 when Shire and all, uh, et al. imagined this system. Um, the question then becomes, what kind of distribution is this? Um, is it a, a democratizing of labor? Uh, we could say it could have expanded. We can imagine a system like this expanding the possibility of grading opportunities for GAs everywhere, for teaching assistants everywhere. Um, and that's what I want us to be thinking about, is what exactly is democratized in those moments of atomizing uh, and distributing labor over systems. So some other allegories I want to have in the back of our minds are other forms of contingent labor that depend on um, centers and margins that have fairly well established uh, routes of who's putting out work and who's picking it up, that there's something systematic about, the, about those flows, um, and that it's, that it's something we can imagine could, um, would require a lot of uh, regulatory intervention to change those flows. Uh, one of the best examples that comes to mind for me are thinking about day laborers. If you go into any urban setting and in many rural settings now, you can quickly locate the place where if I want to pick up temporary work, um, if, I have the, uh, if I have particular sets of skills, I can hang out on a particular street corner and imagine that I could be picked up, um, be able to maybe go paint a house, um, <coughs> mow a lawn. Most of this kind of labor is manual. Um, it's fairly invisible in the sense that um, uh, it's not stabilized in a building, but yet it's also rendered very visible at particular hours. There's a flow to it. Um, there's a workflow to it. Perhaps another, um, and I don't even know if I'd say this is an allegory as much as it's a continuation of crowd labor, is to think about outsourced labor. So much of what I'm about to describe to you um, as the, the new conditions for crowdsourcing as a form of paid microwork really work on the um, infrastructure of the last 20 years of business process outsourcing in many places, where there um, are workflows that can be um, effectively disaggregated from the single employee who was maybe the office manager who took care of all the bookings, took care of all of uh, looking up references, and that those jobs could be split and sent to individuals um, or think medical records. There's quite a bit of information that's now back office processing that's moved um, not just to other countries, but um, to different locations that, again, reproduce those centers and margins of who's um, a producer, who's the center of productivity and capitalization of the valuation of that, of that work, and who's um, basically on the, the crap end of that deal of picking up the, the jobs that are available as they become available. So let me, with those allegories in mind, let me set up a working definition. And the one that I like to use the most is from um, a, a legal scholar who um, argues that uh, the key elements here are to think about the distribution and the pooling of online workers to pick up tasks. Um, so that the elements I want you to, to just hold on to are thinking about this distribution and who exactly um, is the distributor and who is the person picking up tasks. And I think this can apply to any of the settings in which we're thinking about crowdsourcing. Who originates the call um, for help, you might say, and who is it that's imagined to be available and what makes them available. And then importantly, what kind of crowd organizes around the availability um, but the contingency of this kind of call, this kind of work. This is what online crowd uh, markets look like. And then could I just get a quick show of hands? When I say Amazon Mechanical Turk, how many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? Awesome. OK. So most of you probably know how, and I, I both didn't want to assume, and you, know, you can be in talks where that's like the last thing you want to assume. So just let me trace out a couple of key elements here. It's to think of the online market, the, the, the main element I want you to take away from, from, from this slide. Um, <laughs> This should fit for any of us who are talking about crowd anything, is that what defines the possibility of assembling um, these masses of folks is that there's some system other than my face that plays the interface, right? So the API here is the mediator. It is the go-between. 
It's what allows someone to imagine they're having a conversation with somebody who set up the task. And the degree to which we are having that conversation or asking them, don't talk to me, um, are, are key pieces, affordances, you might say, of the system. So have that in mind as we talk about digital labor. Because I think if, I, if we think back to the, the, to the opening keynote and the welcome you get if you're doing penguin hunter? No. <laughs> Penguin watcher? Watch. <laughs> Watch, not hunt. Penguin watcher. The invitation and really the, um, the provocation is to imagine an engagement with something that perhaps you love and you want to save. Um, so with any interface, imagine what are you being asked, uh, what's being asked of you? And who do you imagine is asking, um, asking that of you? So crowdsourcing, I'd argue, as a form of paid labor, is expanding in two important ways. And the ways in which they represent the call to the person who's going to pick up that job are critical here. Because in both cases, whether it's machine learning that's effectively asking crowds to serve as artificial intelligence fodder, um, uh, and ask people to train data by looking um, and doing judgments to refine the data that's there so that an algorithm can be further improved and therefore the model for how to code and then get rid of the person who's doing that judgment um, can be iterated and reiterated and improved upon. Um, or machines, machine learning is just using people as data. So old Clippy here. Um, that's, that's Clippy from Microsoft saying, sometimes I watch you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> um, machine learning can use that material too. Um, but either way, um, our interactions with the interface, with the API, become fodder. The other direction that crowd labor is growing, I'd argue, uh, is to conceptualize crowds as code. So in these cases, and this is much more akin in, in some ways, maybe the, the nefarious version of thinking about Galaxy Zoo, where it's very much invested in keeping the human in the process of computation. Um, my favorite examples that are beautiful examples, very, um, very wonderful examples, uh, collaborative assistance um, interface that, called VizWiz that Jeff Bigham at Carnegie Mellon built that specifically that runs on Amazon Mechanical Turk and a few other social media platforms, uh, Facebook being another one, that will give you the opportunity to um, either volunteer or be paid by someone else um, to help someone who, um, who is visually impaired be able to identify uh, food in their pantry or other items around the household. So if I need help and I have uh, a, a visual challenge and I need to figure out, are these a can of garbanzo beans or kidney beans, I can literally hold up my phone, call, use VizWiz, the application, and get another person to call out, I see kidney beans. And then I can go on with my recipe. So it's a really brilliant um, uh, engagement but also embedding of um, individuals in a, a moment of, of need. Um, citizen science, which uh, is another form of human computation that we spent most of the opening keynote celebrating, which is beautiful, it's so fun. Um, and one of my favorite examples, if you haven't seen this, is iWire. It's run by a lab at MIT. Um, it has millions of, of participants, players. It's gamified, and I think that critique of gamification is, is definitely, hopefully, something we'll talk about in Q&A. Um, but the goal of iWire is to identify brain neurons, is to map brain neurons. So it's strictly a tracing uh, program. And it's mapped, um, that green little blob um, shows you a, a very um, necessitant, you know, here's a neuron to, to map. And by the end of the next day, all of that mapping had happened. It, uh, as the opening keynote said, it, it it, it ran past in exponential numbers any work that had been done on mapping neurons. You know, so it's this incredible example of integrating um, people into a computational process. Now the thing about comparing either machine learning using uh, uh, AI for fodder or human computation and machine learning hoping eventually we can get rid of the people and human computation saying I want to keep the people is that in both cases they're not imagining a worker. They're imagining data that I can draw into and learn from, in the case of AI and fodder, or they're imagining code 
I want a person to act as a piece of code. I don't want that person to pop up and say anything. I want them to integrate with my code. Now, I think there are cases in citizen science particularly where there is a direct address. There's definitely a desire to engage the human and human computation. But when it comes to paid crowd labor that's reliant on human computation, I'd argue that both in that case where it could be quite humanizing or in the case of ML, and I'd say these are the two fronts where we see the expansion of crowd labor. These two fronts, neither of them have a conceptualization of the human involved as a laborer, as a worker. They imagine them as um, part of a process that's been built with, uh, with the requester's need in mind. So if that's the case, that means the API, and in many ways, the framing of what it is we're doing in crowdsourcing often keeps us at a distance from the individuals, the people, um, who are participating in these actions. So what would it be like to study the crowd both close up to understand the context of the people who are coming to the sites that we build or that others are building, um, but also to understand it at scale, to try and move across those dimensions? What would that look like? What could that teach us? Um, that's what I'm in the middle and moving towards two-thirds almost through um, uh, working on now. Uh, it's a project that in very specific ways is a methodological meditation for me. I've tr most of my experience, of, most of my training and most of my, uh, my research has been field work. It means there's never a day where I don't have to contend, contend with negotiating what I'm doing with another human being to get my work done. In, in, a very, in a very literal, visceral way. Like, I've gotten stood up at so many interviews, I can't even tell you. So I'm not used to thinking that I could actually get any sense of social uh, exchange or interaction without having to be there and see it. So that's what's really compelling for me. And from probably many of you in the audience, you can't imagine anything worse than having to sit down and talk to somebody. I have plenty of friends. It's OK. You don't have to admit that you might be one of them. Um, but so for me, this was really a chance to think through what did, would it mean to bring this ethnographic sensibility to a process that could easily allow me to stay at a distance, um, to be able to think about what's a new method we could use to get at the cultural meaning um, and the political implications and the ethical demands of crowdsourcing. Um, oh, I think this might be out of order. The other thing this project's after, and I'm going to tell you what this project is in a second, the other thing we're after is to think about this last mile of technological innovation. And this is the part I'm, I'm, I'm actually still chewing on quite a bit, so I'd please feel, I would love your pushback, because I'd, I'd like some help thinking about this. Is that if I think about automation, and if I think about that as what I believe is going to drive much of the, um, much of the growth of crowdsourcing in the next at least decade, I think about it very much in those historical terms of piecework. It's the last mile. We think that if we just get automation, it's almost there that we'll do away with particular kinds of work. My argument is that what I see is this is the production of a temporary labor pool that's always in the shadow of innovation. Any technological innovation we've ever had, let me say that one more time. If I think about piecework, the Industrial Revolution, there was at no point any imagining of that being possible without the flourish being added to the shirt. There was never a moment where we got rid of that need for um, bridging what the machine couldn't do. What we kept changing was what exactly it was the machine couldn't do, right? So right now, a machine can't translate um, what I'm saying into Dutch. Um, when that is settled, and for some people who believe in the singularity, it's just around the corner. When that's settled, that doesn't mean, my argument would be, that we would ever lose the need for that temporary pool. The problem is that we don't treat it as um, a pool that actually sticks around. And that's why um, I've been playing with this notion of an ambient workforce. So if technological innovation always produces this ambient workforce that's there to fill the gap that's imagined to be going away at any time, then what exactly are the labor conditions of that kind of work if I take seriously that it's part and parcel of technological innovation? Not some side thing that's going away, but literally what drives innovation. 
um, that I actually have to imagine I'm almost there and in that striving, I have to fill in the gap with, with people's skills when we're talking about automation particularly. Um, I want to dwell just for a second on this, this last point of, the, of this quality of the ambient workforce. And, and I was really struck um, uh, when the opening keynote, when Chris said that what he sees in his system most vital to it, what keeps it going, is the, he didn't put it in these words, the fresh blood, right? So you've got this huge block of people who are doing the bulk of what needs to be done um, in identifying the penguins. And then you've got all those little boxes. You know, I, I, for folks who weren't, in the, weren't here, it's a beautiful, the long tail of um, thin participation, but present participation that keeps it kind of turning over. I absolutely see that in crowdsourcing. I see folks who structure their labor around making this something stable, and at the same time, it's, it's still contingent. It's not a 40-hour work week. They're making, the individuals putting this work together are crafting that kind of temporality. They're trying to craft that sense of regularity, but within a system that literally depends on everybody at some point feeling like they could walk away. Because that's actually what the system invites. The API invites me to come in, do a job, walk away. It doesn't say come in, stick around for 40 hours, get some benefits, and we'll see where you go. That is not the invitation, right? So I want to contend with that, that this system actually requires, as Chris was arguing, both. Um, so any attempts we make to try and stabilize it, to have more people participating at a stable rate, we're missing the value of the, of the serendipity. Um, that's not regular, that's just kind of a, a steady flow. So, okay. Um, the question we're asking is who participates in crowdsourcing on platforms like Amazon Mechanical Turk? Um, and I'm gonna, I have three other platforms to introduce you to, but the, the quality of these platforms, who does work that is not tightly identified with a skill set, like editorial work. I'm interested in the image tagger. I want to know the folks who do classification. Who, the folks who don't organize their identities around particular tasks, who are those people? And what does the rest of their day look like? What are the social and material conditions that structure their participation in labor that otherwise has no identity attached to it, um, other than craft work, we might say. So who participates in this? When I'm looking at a crowdsourcing platform, um, I actually need an interdisciplinary team to work out the details. So Sid's up there in the corner. He's a computer scientist. Um, we've have him, had a mathematician who's been helping us with our maps. I'm hoping to recruit other people who like to build maps to help me. Um, uh, Sarah brings a lot of chops in econometrics and labor studies. Um, there are two field workers, Shoab and Deepdi, who work with me in India who have been there uh, since October when we started the field work in India. This project is based in India and in the United States to compare um, those two labor pools that are a byproduct of particularly Amazon Mechanical Turk's practice of paying in rupees and dollars. It produced these two different labor pools that are very distinct. Um, and Rajesh Patel is actually the builder of one of the platforms that we're studying. So the four cases we're looking at are um, the one most familiar to you, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, and I would argue it still um, uh, will be, for some time, the most traffic for this kind of, um, of uh, sensorial skill work that doesn't have to do with um, identifiable um, uh, job skills like editorial work. A second platform, MobileWorks, which was built um, as a startup to respond to Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, it's a social entrepreneurship that um, promises a 40-hour work week and pays different pay rates that are imagined to be living wages in different, uh, in different countries. Um, Microsoft has an internal tool, and this is semi-public knowledge, so don't tell anybody. Um, I'm kidding. So they're one of the few companies that admits that they do have um, a tool that is the equivalent of Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, and it operates with the presumption that it can uh, have a non-disclosure agreement with the workers who come on the platform. Um, lar loosely speaking, it's Microsoft and other companies using a company-based, uh, 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 company-facing 
platform, but it's just like Amazon Mechanical Turk in many ways. Um, the acronym is Universal Human Relevance System, because Microsoft is known for its naming. Um, <laughs> and the fourth um, and really fascinating case is Amara.org. Anybody familiar with Amara.org? Oh, good, okay. So it's a really interesting hybrid of a site that started out as a fan site of um, folks who would come to the site with television shows, films in different languages, many of them South Asian, Southeast Asian languages, and they would translate them for friends um, and swap them mm -hmm. on the platform. It was incredibly um, good at getting around any copyright issues because most of these programs were programs that were never going to be translated into any other languages. So the owners of the program said, sure, translate them. Can we keep the translations? Eventually, it turned into um, a labor force that was available to do translation. So Netflix uses it for closed captioning. Um, they have huge contracts building right now with all of these different companies that want an easy way with high skill, high quality work to do translation work. And the crowd, which is around 500 workers, um, switch between donating their time, volunteering their time, and uh, doing a, a kind of share economy of their labor and um, being available for pay. So it's a really interesting case, and the, um, the founder of it, Dean Jansen, um, really wanted to get involved in this project because he doesn't know what kind of labor force he has, and he doesn't want to create a sweatshop. So that was, that's almost a direct quote from him. So these are the four platforms we've got to work with. I'm exhausted just describing them. Like, this is an exhausting project, um, and I know I'm doing a lot of things wrong, but we basically have five data sources to work with ethnographic work, and I move between the United States and India pretty regularly right now, and I don't know what time zone I'm in, so. Um, but most of that work is being done both in English, Urdu, and Hindi, uh, and I don't speak Urdu or Hindi, so I'm really limited in what I can do. It's been quite humbling. But we're also using surveys that we've launched on all four of the platforms. Actually, they're on three. We're about to launch on the fourth on Amara, um, to be able to ask a very detailed uh, questionnaire or survey. It's an 80 question survey that gets at things like, do you have a second income? Do you have, what are your, what's your family household look like? What kind of education do you have? What education do your parents have? It's a really old fashioned sociological demographic survey. And we'll be able to make the data available to you when we are done with the project. So the whole goal of this is to create data sets that would be publicly accessible so that people can work with these materials. I mean, I'm going to come back to why it's so hard to find these data sets in a second. We work with log data, uh, metadata, the workflows. We have access to um, the backend data from UHRS, Amara, and MobileWorks. Um, Amazon Mechanical Turk has not been willing to share their back their backend data. Uh, some of it's more scrapable, so um, that's handy. But they're they're actually um, fairly. Um, uh, tight with their material. Um, we also do these system level measurements, and I'm going to show you some pretty maps from that in a second. Um, and there are efforts to be able to use the system to do some tracking that otherwise isn't obvious um, uh, in, the, in the log data. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. But the goal is to integrate these so that anything we're launching as a systems measurement is actually coming from ethnographic questions. So when we started noticing certain patterns of of um, collaboration, and I'm going to spend much of the talk, uh, most of the time I have left talking about collaboration, we immediately started thinking, how could we measure that, which I'm usually not that worried about doing as an ethnographer, how could we measure that at scale? How could we get a sense of the, the X factor of that, of that collaboration? And then um, my training as a critical scholar would be awfully hard to ignore reading um, uh, closely the industry rhetoric around these platforms and the regulatory regimes that frame what kind of labor this is. Because right now, it's legally not defined. We have no legal definition for what is a person who does this work. So keep that in mind. We have um, an employment situation that's completely um, uh, undefined. So just to give you a couple of key features, I'm hoping that most of you are familiar with this. But when Amazon la launched Mechanical Turk in 2005, um, they had every kind of task. They had image tagging, they had data entry, they had transcription, they had translation. Um, 
it still has many of those elements, but arguably it's starting to sift into a very specific labor market that offers these um, tasks that otherwise don't seem to attach to skill sets you might identify with a translator, um, an editorial, a copy editor. And we see plenty of other platforms that have tried to take up that slack. So Duolingo could be considered one, but certainly Amara would be a translation site and a transcription site in some ways. Um, Crowdflower is another site where if you were going to get something done for your website, you might go to Crowdflower first. So when we start seeing that kind of, not siloing, but that sort of separation of the market, um, I think it helps us make sense of what sorts of conditions are making some work possible and other work harder to do. Uh, but the key features I think that keep uh, AMT alive um, are that it does pay in cash. Um, and that's uh, not to say that the other ones uh, don't, but to the, um, the barrier to getting to that cash payout is higher, uh, which is surprising because it's high enough already on AMT. But also, um, there's so much of this work that originated in the, in the United States initially. Officially, work can only originate in the United States uh, on, um, on Amazon Mechanical Turk. So going back to that point about centers and margins, really clearly delineates where the center and where the margin, where are the workers and where are the employers imagined in this system, and who's called out to be an employer versus a worker. Um, and then lastly, probably the most important element here is that I don't get paid until uh, an employer or a requester um, says my work is good enough. So at a system at scale, trying to make sense of what would be a ways to um, adjudicate, adjudicate differences uh, of opinion on what counts as quality work, um, this is a great site to think through that problem. Okay, some pretty pictures. So one of the, one of the first things we did um, was do a, um, put out a task on Amazon Mechanical Turk. This is, this is going to run on the other platforms as well. But we ran this task because pretty quickly when I went to go do my interviews in India, I found out that the IP addressing is really wrong. <laughs> IP addresses, uh, and, and I felt silly because I immediately talked to uh, systems friends who were like, well, yeah, their routers are really crazy. So no, you can't rely on IP addresses. In fact, the self-reported IP addresses that we have in our surveys are far more accurate than anything the system tells us. So we immediately went back to figure out, well, how can we map what kind of presence we have for this crowd. It's the ongoing question of how many people are in this labor market? How many people do this kind of work? This is a shot at moving towards understanding that. This particular, what you see, those red dots, are where we have high concentrations of participants. The shading that you see that doesn't come across too well is where there's internet access, um, where there's concentration of internet access. And just notice some patterns here. Right? So if I take that internet access and then I map um, where our population density is, you see a pretty close fit. This is such an obvious point, but for anybody who's been studying digital inequalities and digital divide, this really crystallizes. If you don't have access to the internet, you are not going to be getting into this labor market anytime soon. Right? There is no quick fix to find um, access to this labor market. And it directly connects to, in very interesting ways in the United States, to some patterns. In India, it's a very straightforward story. In India, it maps on to business process outsourcing that was put in place in the 1980s. So it concentrates in the South, where there are strong language skills, primarily because there's such resistance to learning Hindi as a second language. So many people, there's about, I mean, there's 140 languages in the country. So in the South, there's, a, an, there's an intense desire to have English be a lingua franca, and it positioned the South for business process outsourcing. It repositioned it for crowdsourcing. Um, in the United States, it's a much more complicated story in that the 20 most populous states are underrepresented, so the opposite of India, um, but they're overrepresented in smaller sized cities. Now, we've got some hypotheses for this. If I'm in Knoxville, I might have fewer opportunities. Tennessee, sorry, Knoxville, Tennessee, middle of nowhere of the United States. If I'm in that mid-sized city, it's actually a very nice city. If I'm in that city, I'm going to have fewer opportunities for equivalent wage work to what I might find in, um, in Mechanical Turk. This is a good bet. I should go and do this kind of work. If I'm in New York City, there are more opportunities for me to pick up cash. 
So we could perhaps see that. That's one theory. Um, and again, in India, it's the opposite pattern. And it absolutely maps on. And actually, what we're seeing is some amazing sorting in terms of skill sets. So now that we're on other platforms that do different skill sets like translation and transcription, we're seeing far more concentration of those workers in the north, in Gorgon and other parts of Delhi where there is um, an IT sector that's established that's a bit more um, uh, driving the, the original work. So there's an established IT sector as opposed to in the south where it's all about, it's all about outsourcing. Okay. So, the amazing thing for me as an ethnographer, I was able to use this to figure out how can I find people in this crowd. So when we sent out those surveys, at the very end of the survey, we said, would you be willing to do an interview in person? And whoever said yes, uh, we contacted them and we went and met them. So that's how we've been doing the interviewing, is to just follow the crowd to their home or wherever they'd like to meet. It's not, I won't creep them out by just showing up, hey. but. Considering this is such a distributed population, it's a needle in a haystack for me as an ethnographer to be able to find where the crowd is. So to be able to reach out to the people who are doing the survey, which of course creates all these sampling issues that are fascinating, but it's an opportunity for me to get a sense, am I in the right locations? And sure enough, for the people who are responding to our survey and said, yes, I do an interview, it also maps on to where we have a concentration of crowd workers. So it's really nice to know that I'm not just um, which doing ethnographic work. You could easily be going down the wrong road when it comes to trying to find some sort of representativeness um, to your sample. Um, and this keeps me, uh, gives me a course correct as an ethnographer in the field. Um, so one way to think about um, what we've learned so far is to just take away the big lesson. If there's one thing that I hope that I can share with you, it's that workers are not autonomous. Um, this has major implications for anybody who's running research on crowdsourcing platforms right now. Um, because for the most part, we've imagined that those links, those, those edges between workers don't exist, that they're isolated, um, atomized, anonymous workers. And we rely on that um, siloing in many cases, particularly if you're doing any sort of research where you're trying to get a one-off opinion of something. Um, really problematic if they actually happen to be um, teaching each other how to do work, sharing lists of requesters that are good requesters, sharing it in person, calling each other at night to tell each other what good gigs came online. That's the kind of collaboration, really deep collaboration that we saw. So um, these are just a few quotes that I pulled from some of our interviews of um, the social value and the, really the social capital that can be built by being the person who knows this system and can navigate it and show someone else through it. Um, and the value that someone's getting, not from the pennies they're making in doing the crowd work, but in being the person who taught this skill and distributed this access to their neighbors. That's part of the value they're extracting from this system. Um, they're also doing a lot of talking and a lot of collaboration. So they're sharing information about um, who the good requesters are. If you have an Amazon Mechanical Turk account and you haven't looked at your requesters account lately in your rating, you might want to do that because it really, really um, shapes what work people are willing to, to risk to do. So being able to assess risk in this market has been fascinating. Um, but the degree to which this builds social bonds um, and reinforces social bonds that are already in place. And then for the people we've interviewed um, where this kind of collaboration isn't present and what kinds of social conditions um, make sense of that lack of, of support. We never would have thought to measure collaboration. I mean, Sid was just blown away that there was this much collaboration. Because if you're looking at the system level data, it shows you nothing. There's no signal that there's any sort of interaction. That's only something you're going to learn if you're looking um, at a different scale. So if we're talking about collaboration close up, and I'm just going to zing through these, one of the, particularly for the India field work, was how dependent families were on using um, a point of access. So this has major implications if you're building a site, for example, Amazon Mechanical Turk tries to block, um, uh, if you're using the same IP address and you have multiple accounts, it assumes that you are cheating. 
It does not have a way of con considering a cultural concept, uh, a cultural context where you have multiple individuals in the same household using the same computer to access the, access the site. So there are a host of ways in which the design does not account for anything other than this kind of universalized Western notion of organizing um, both family life and, and any sort of engagement. Um, there are plenty of cases in India, you actually have to get a paper paycheck. That's how, uh, how you're paid out by Amazon. So there is a great deal of anxiety about how to get a paper paycheck because the postal system is unreliable in India. So even that issue of the cost, the sheer anxiety of waiting for and having to essentially build up your account for a month before you get paid out is a part of the labor conditions of this, of this labor market. Um, the takeaway here is to think about crowds as networks as much as they're individuals. Um, and that they're, they're interacting in very specific social contexts. They're not just generically out there. In India, it might be the middle of Ramadan, and that means you're going to have a different flow to your work schedule. Like those elements come to really matter. Um, at the systems level, it wouldn't necessarily show, and it may not matter to you, but in terms of being able to um, conceptualize the human labor that's being engaged, it's pretty important, we'd argue. Um, I'm going to zip past these because I want to make sure we leave enough time to have some conversation. Uh, what you're seeing here is another measure that we did, a system, uh, systems level measurement, to ask people um, how they found out about our tasks. And those spikes you see in black are um, postings to discussion forums. So not the platform, um, but the discussion forums are the places where people are getting good information about where the work is. So if you've ever posted something to a platform and thought that was going to do it, you probably might think about going to a discussion forum. It's going to circulate more quickly. So in short, crowdsourcing is much less about a requester relationship with the API, um, of, you know, creating some sort of op opaque exchange with workers who are out separately sitting away from each other. It looks much more like requesters and tasks in a flow of networks and clusters depending on what that work is, and depending on how much someone is trying to make it reliable work. So what are the implications here? Um, it certainly can affect your research results. So that's, for, for many uh, engineers that I've talked with, that's an important takeaway. Most of them are not thinking um, that that's, that's an element they have to consider. Um, it could impact the motivations that someone has for why they're participating on a site. Did their friend tell them about it? Um, was it something that they're doing because they, they want to get in good stead with their, their girlfriend or their boyfriend? Um, what are the constraints of these flows um, across international service markets? So we heard a great paper today, um, uh, Mark and, um, and Vili's paper, and, and I suspect you had like three or four authors on our paper. It was a fantastic paper. Thinking about what are the, what are the factors that contribute to whether um, some workers are um, uh, seen as, as quality workers or not. Um, but in the end, all of this collaboration really refutes the idea of autonomous, anonymous individuals. And I'd argue we should be thinking that's probably the case for all the crowdsourcing we're studying. There's really no reason that we should presume as a default that autonomy and that anonymity. It wouldn't really fit with how social people are, um, with, particularly with their, with their um, media. So the other small takeaway from this is it could for those who are worried about um, the rights of these workers, it could set the stage for a different way of thinking about advocacy and organizing. To recognize that there is already in place, in many cases, um, channels of collaboration and conversation and exchange, rather than imagining we're reaching out to individual workers who just need to change their point of reference. Right? So to see there are conversations um, and engagements and organizing that are already in place. So the challenges that I think that this presents, um, one challenge I want to suggest is, is data hoarding, uh, in that access to crowd data is often um, limited by uh, proprietary issues, right? So I can't get on AMT. I have had some conversations with some of the, with the folks who run the platform, but I do have access to, Mac, to Microsoft's internal tool. Um, anybody collaborating with me would too, but you would have to be collaborating with me to get to that data. I think that's a huge problem, and we have, you know, we have this issue in any social media research. So it's, it's the same issue here. But we're talking about labor markets. 
we can't even identify people working in this market because of the um, opacity and the proprietary protection of this data. And I think that's a real problem for thinking about what to do um, with legally defining what this work is. I'd say the other big, big problem is that we keep our distance. Um, if I'm someone who's just not comfortable, like it's icky to imagine contacting a crowd worker and asking them about their experience, I should probably team up with someone who likes doing that. Because I think we're missing a lot of good questions, a lot of interesting design implications by keeping our distance. Um, we've, we keep treating crowds like they're just lumps, like they're aggregations um, of human behavior as opposed to social actors who are interacting not just with each other but their own context. We are missing some of the most important material that helps us understand why they are going like crazy to Galaxy Zoo, right? Or why they're completely enthralled with a particular MOOC. We miss that. So we can't treat engaging people as some extra that gets us a good story after we've mined the data, I would argue. Um, so we have to shift from thinking about crowds and think about people. Um, and that has some pretty serious implications for us as researchers. Uh, and this is where I'll, I'll, I'll end is thinking about the uncharted ethics of studying platforms as sites of human interaction. And not just sites of human interaction, but sites we are interacting with people when we study them. That's a, that's a whole level of ethnographic uh, or of, of ethical obligation that, in my case for my field work, has ended up meaning um, thinking about the experiences of women who are trying to support their families while they're at home and they're having to navigate doing crowd work and at the same time um, dealing with the discomfort of uh, perhaps a husband or um, uh, in-laws who do not want them doing that work because they're not sure what they're doing on a computer all day. Right? So having to help the people I'm interviewing navigate that as part of my way of engaging in their experience of a very gendered um, framing of their, of their labor. Um, I've found myself trying to help workers find out why their accounts were suspended by Amazon. This summer has just been um, a very long summer of workers losing their accounts, having their accounts suspended in India, and there's been no clear statement from Amazon. So everyone we've interviewed um, uh, who's lost an account has contacted me. Um, and that puts, for me, um, a, you know, puts on my plate um, a choice. Do I ignore that that's a request that's, that's not you know, anything I can deal with? Or do I contact Amazon and try to advocate for them to get their account back? And I choose the latter. Um, if I was working at the systems level, maybe I wouldn't feel on the hook. And then lastly, of course, protecting the respondents' data, which I think is probably one of the biggest challenges we have in sharing data. Um, when I'm trying to figure out how to get these data sets to other researchers, I'm constantly trying to think, um, how am I going to effectively make it something that's shareable but that doesn't, um, that doesn't um, compromise uh, their rights to respect and privacy? Oh, I'm going to zip past these. Yeah, 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 yeah. Implications. Okay. So if crowd work right now strips away a lot of what makes a job a job, what would it look like to try and figure out um, either how to build it back in or reimagine what a job looks like. And I feel like I'm heading down that ladder path, which is incredibly scary. But in many ways, when I'm listening to the workers describe what it is they actually like out of these systems, I very much relate to the things they like. They like not feeling like they're on a schedule. Um, they don't really want to be penned into an office. Does anybody relate to that? Right? So I have these moments where I'm trying to think, OK, what would it look like to advocate for the possibility of that ambient workforce that also deeply, deeply depends on certain kinds of stability making that ambience possible. So for example, in India, what makes it possible for people to kind of go in and out of that system um, is really the very gendered households that mean that somebody is there watching children, the mothers or the mothers-in-law. Someone is there watching elders. In the United States, that safety net is not there. So in many ways, when we're comparing the data sets from US workers and their experiences of having a sense of security 
compared to the India-based workers. I often see places where the security that India-based workers have, which is absolutely built on the backs of women, is something that the workers in the United States are having to pay in cash for child care, for elder care. So it's making sense of, well, if I want this ambient workforce, I better be thinking of things like universal health care, child care, elder care. Like maybe that's what makes this market possible. And I'm optimistic enough to think that if technological innovation really, really depends on getting this crowd labor um, organized enough that it has masses of people to advance automation so that I can be translated into Swedish right now, then that means that perhaps we could get technology companies, industries, and governments invested in rethinking what support mechanisms have to be in place to make an ambient workforce possible. So if at the Industrial Revolution, it was pretty quickly recognized that you needed universal education as a way to train workers for the factory, perhaps this could be our sneaky way of rethinking what kinds of structures we could put in place to create this kind of um, flow. So to build these better tools, we've got to accept that people are always going to mess with them. They're always going to do novel things to meet their needs. And we likely won't have an idea of what those needs are. Um, their social identities are always going to be part of that play. Uh, and their social contexts are going to significantly shape what they can and can't do with those technologies. There is no generic crowd. So if that's the case, then if we pay really close attention to the dimensions, not saying we get it right when we do ethnographic work, but that we're actually attending to those dimensions, perhaps we have a better shot of understanding what are the conditions, the very real material condition, conditions that are going to make a difference that improve the experience that they have uh, of that work particularly. Um, what are the analyses of social connections that we can get to that otherwise would not be available at the systems level? And particularly for employment, how could we marry uh, the social needs that we might see and have them co-evolve with these systems at scale? So with that, thank you.